Greetings viewers, this is the Mathinator coming at you once again, and on this video I will be doing SAT practice test number one math calculator section. So you can go to collegeboard.org and download and print out your own copy of the test and I think it would be a good idea for you to do the test along with me. And of course, the purpose of these videos is for you to build up and enhance your math skills so that when you take your standardized test, when you take the SAT, you will be ready to knock that thing out because you have a, a vast knowledge of math and you're entering there with a, a grand arsenal of math skills. And as you can see here, this is um, some of the information that they give you, the formulas and some of the notes uh, from the test. Now, I always suggest that when you're taking the SAT, make sure you read every question carefully. Math section or whatever section you're working on, read each question carefully. Now, on this math section, you need to um, identify your givens. What are my unknowns? Uh, what is it that it's asking me to actually do? And then we have to figure out how do we know when we have arrived at the correct answer. And of course, the more you practice, the more you build up your knowledge, the better equipped you will be to do well and have success on the test. Now, what I do is read each question one time, and as I am solving the problems, I'd like to talk a little bit about the concept, because of course, when you take the test, you won't be facing the exact same questions, but you will be facing the similar concepts and the similar topics that you need to know. So I also like to give a, a few tips, hints, and words of advice as I go through this. So let's go ahead and get started. John runs at different speeds as part of his training program. The graph shows his target heart rate at different times during his workout. On which interval is the target heart rate strictly increasing, then strictly decreasing? All right, so this has to do with reading graphs. And of course, if we're talking about strictly increasing, that is going to be a slope going up, and then strictly decreasing is a slope going down. So what we're looking for is an interval that looks kind of like an upside down V, where we're strictly increasing, then strictly decreasing, and that looks a lot like this interval right here, and that is from 40 minutes to 60 minutes, or between 40 and 60 minutes, as our answer choice says. All right, if y equals kx, where k is a constant, and y equals 24 when x equals 6, what is the value of y when x equals 5? So we have a classic direct variation right here, y equals kx. So we know y equals 24 when x equals 6. So we have 24 equals k times 6, meaning 4 equals k. Now we want to know the value of y when x equals 5. Again, when do we know we have the correct answer? Right there, we just solve for k, but we need to solve for the value of y. So that means y is going to equal 4 times 5, so y equals 20. Answer choice C. In the figure above, lines L and M are parallel and lines S and T are parallel. If the measure of angle 1 is 35 degrees, what is the measure of angle 2? So here we need to know ACBAT. Parallel lines are cut by a transversal and what angles are congruent and the other relationships there. So since angle 1 is 35 degrees, we know that this angle right here is congruent to angle 1, so that one is also 35 degrees. So that's angle um, or lines L and M with T as the transversal. Now if we look at lines S and T with M as their transversal, that means this also has to equal 35 degrees because it's going to be congruent um, to that angle that we just um, put right there. Now the next thing we've got is that this is a straight angle, so the measure of angle 2 plus 35 degrees has to equal 180 degrees, and so that just leaves us with no other choice but D. If 16 plus 4x is 10 more than 14, what is the value of 8x? So let's go ahead. Um, this is partly an interpretation problem, so we've got 16 plus 4x is, that means equals 10 more than 14, so that would be 14 plus 10 meaning 16 plus 4x equals 24. We want to know what is the value of 8x. Well, what I'm looking at here is I have 4x, so if I know what 4x equals, I can figure out what 8x equals because 8x is going to be twice as much as that. So subtracting that 16 from both sides gives me 4x equals 8, so twice as much of that is going to be 16. 8x is going to equal 
16. Which of the following graphs best shows a strong negative association between D and T? Well, in order to answer this, we need to know what strong negative association means. All right, a strong negative association between the x-axis and the y-axis means we're going to have a downhill slope, which means as the x-axis increases, the y-axis is going to decrease. So in this case, as D increases, T decreases. Well, we do not see that type of association with A, we do not see that type of association with B. We do not see that type of association with C. So the only one is D. And that strong negative association means the dots are going to be grouped kind of closely together as they go downhill. A hospital stores one type of medicine in two decagram containers. Based on the information given in the box above, how many one milligram doses are there in one two decagram container? So this one is all about um, unit analysis, dimensional type analysis problem. So the first thing we need to do is go from decagrams to milligrams. So one decagram is 10 grams. So let's look at one decagram. I like to say DCG. You don't hear too much about decagrams. All right. That equals 10 grams. So we're going to say 10, but each gram is 1,000 milligrams. So one decagram is equal to 10,000 milligrams. And then multiplying by 2, that means 2 decagrams is going to be 2 times that. So D. 20,000 milligrams in a two decagram container. The number of rooftops with solar panel installations in five cities is shown in the graph above. If the total number of installations is 27,500, what is an appropriate label for the vertical axis of the graph? So this one is all about reading graphs and interpreting, interpreting, yeah, the data in graphs. So let's just look at if we add up um, all of these bar graphs, we have 9 plus 5 is 14, plus 6 is 20, plus 4 is 24, plus 3 and a half is 27.5. So if we just go straight up off the numbers, we're looking at 27.5. But it says these numbers represent 27,500. So going from 27.5 to 27,500, we've got to go 1, 2, 3. So we're multiplying by three orders of 10, which is 10 times 10 times 10, which is 1,000. So that would be number of installations in thousands. For what value of n is the absolute value of n minus 1 plus 1 equal to 0? All right, so let's look at this. We're talking about n minus 1 absolute value plus 1 equals 0. All right, we need to isolate that absolute value portion. So we got n minus 1 absolute value equals negative 1. Well, the thing about absolute value, absolute value is always positive. You cannot have, once you isolate the absolute value portion in an equation, it cannot be set equal to a negative number. There is no solution. There is no such value of n. The speed of a sound wave in air depends on the air temperature. The formula above shows the relationship between A, the speed of a sound wave in feet per second, and T, the air temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Which of the following expresses the air temperature in terms of the speed of a sound wave? So we've run into this um, a few times where we have a formula or an equation that we have to rearrange and solve for a different variable. So we're talking about a literal equation, meaning so solving for that T, we're going to have to subtract that 1,052 from each side. That rules out B. And then we're going to end up dividing by that 1.08. So we have answer choice A. At which of the following air temperatures will the speed of a sound wave be closest to 1,000 feet per second? So we, we're trying to solve for the temperature. We've already done that in number 9. So now we're looking at 1,000 minus 1,052 divided by 1.08. So negative 52. divided by 1.08, that is approximately negative 48.1. So answer choice B, negative 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Which of the following numbers is not a solution of the inequality 3x minus 5 is greater than or equal to 4x minus 3? So we just are straight up solving a linear inequality. Subtract that 4x from each side, negative x greater than or equal to, add that 5 to each side, 
greater than or equal to 2. Uh, we don't have or we can't have that negative. We know when we multiply or divide by negative with an inequality, it flips our sign. So x less than or equal to negative 2. Which one of those values, which one of those answer choices is not less than or equal to negative 2? And it is a, negative 1. Based on the histogram above, of the following, which is closest to the average arithmetic mean number of seeds per apple? So this is about reading histograms. Histograms is about frequency. All right, so the apples that had three seeds, two of the apples had three seeds in them. So we're looking for the number of seeds. So three times two, that's six seeds there. None of the apples had four seeds. Four of the apples had five seeds. So four times five, that's 20. One had six. Two had seven, so that's 14 seeds, and three of them had nine, that's 27 seeds. Okay, so now we want to add all those up. Six and six is 12, plus 34, plus 27 is 73. Total of 73 seeds in 12 apples, and that is approximately six. Answer choice C. A group of 10th grade students responded to a survey that asked which math course they were currently enrolled in. The survey data were broken down as shown in the table above. Which of the following categories accounts for approximately 19% of all the survey respondents? All right, so we're talking about all survey respondents, so we're looking for what is 19% of that total right there? Which means we need to know what is 19% of that total, so we're looking at 310 times 0 0.19, and that comes out to 58.9. So which number is closest to 58.9, which we can round up? You're not going to have 0.9 students. 59. All right, and we see that is males taking geometry, which is answer choice C. The table above lists the lengths to the nearest inch of a random sample of 21 brown bullhead fish. The outlier measurement of 24 inches is an error. Of the mean, median, and range of the values listed, which will change the most if the 24-inch measurement is removed from the data? All right, so outlier, you don't really need to know um, what an outlier is. But as the name implies, it's a value that's kind of out there um, to the extreme end. When you look at a, a group of data, it's a number that doesn't quite fit in because it's um, extremely less or extremely more. And th there is a more technical definition to that, but it's not important right here, so we won't get into it. Now, let's look at this here. We have, it says 21 brown bullhead fish. And if you add all those numbers up, if we sum those numbers oops, and divide by 21, we will get a number. If we remove that 24, then we can think of that 24 pulling that number out as spreading it out over 20 values. All right, so we're going from 21, take away that value of 24. Now we have 20 values, so that 24 is being spread out of, uh, along 20 values. So that's not going to be much of a change. That's just a little more than one for the mean. Now what about the median? Well, the median is the middle number. So if we list all of the numbers, since the 24 is the extreme, it's going to be at the end. And the rest of these numbers are grouped kind of close together, so it's not really going to change the median. In fact, we can see the median, since we're talking about 21, the median is going to be the 11th value. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So the median is 12. If we take away the 24, then the median is going to be the average of 12 and 12. So that doesn't change at all. What about the range? All right, the range is the largest value minus the smallest value. So right now, the range is 24 minus 8, which is 16. If we take away that 24, now the range is 16 minus 8, which is 8. So that range changes the most. So it really helps to know your measures of central tendency. The graph above displays the total cost C in dollars for renting a boat for H hours. What does the C intercept represent in the graph? Okay, reading graphs, um, well, the y-intercept of a line is the value of y when x equals 0. So since we're talking about cost per time, when the time is 0, the cost is, as we see there, what, $5? All right, so that would be, that would correspond to the initial cost of renting the boat.
because before you even go out, all right, the total number of boats rented, that doesn't make sense because our graph is cost per time. The total number of hours that the boat is rented, well, that doesn't make sense because that would be not be known until we get to the end. And the increase in cost to rent the boat for each additional hour, that does not make sense because that would be the slope. Which of the following represents the relationship between H and C? So as I said, we're looking at a linear relationship, a linear equation. So Y equals MX plus B. So cost is our Y. So cost is going to be our slope, M times the H plus, and we said our initial cost is $5. So now we know we have a plus B that rules out A and D. Now we just need to figure out our slope. And in order to know our slope, now we've got to pay attention here because we have to look at our scale. Our horizontal scale is one, two, three, four. All right, so it's four blocks for one unit. And our vertical scale is one block is each unit or each unit is one block. So if we're looking at this here, we're going in one hour, where we have a rise of one, two, three, and a run of one. We can't just count the blocks. We have to look at the scale of the blocks. So we have a slope of three, um, three to one. So that's going to be C equals three H plus five. Answer choice C. The complete graph of the function F is shown in the X, Y plane above. For what value of x is the value of f of x at its minimum? So that means we're looking for the minimum value. This is our minimum value. That's where f of x or where y is at its minimum. So what is the x value right there? So we just need to read off of our graph, negative 1, negative 2. That is negative 3. Very simple, just reading that graph there. All right. In the xy plane, if 0, 0 is a solution to the system of inequalities above, which of the following relationships between A and B must be true? All right, so this one is an interpretation type question type problem. So we have, so since 0, 0 is a solution, 0, 0 satisfies both inequalities. So 0 is less than A and 0 is greater than B. Now let's put that together in a compound inequality. That means B is less than zero, zero is less than A. Now A cannot equal negative B because that violates the law of non-contradiction, okay? B cannot be less than zero and zero less than A and then A equal negative B. Or actually that could be true, but we're looking at what must be true. That does not have to be true. All right, absolute value of A is greater than the absolute value of B. All right, well, we only need one counterexample. So if B is negative 9 and let's say A is 2, all right, that satisfies this compound inequality, but the absolute value of 2 is not greater than the absolute value of 9. So C is not correct. All right, B cannot be greater than A because B is less than zero and zero is less than A. So that rules out B. So it has to be A must be greater than B. All right, so we have to be real careful when we get to these problems that say what must be true. A food truck sells salads for $6.50 each and drinks for $2 each. The food truck's revenue from selling a total of 209 salads and drinks in one day was $836.50. How many salads were sold that day? We have a system of two equations. We have two items, we have salads, and we have drinks, and they have two different prices. All right, so we know that salads plus drinks equals 209. And 6.50 at $6.50 for each salad times the number of salads plus $2 per drink times the number of drinks, that equals $836.50. And we want to know how many salads were sold that day. So in order to do that, we want to eliminate drinks. We want to eliminate D. What is D in terms of S? And since D is by itself, D has a coefficient of 1, let's just go ahead and isolate that and say that D is equal to 209 minus S. 
So now we can write 6.50s plus 2 times 209 minus s. That equals 836.50. So six, well, doesn't look too good. 6.50s plus 418 minus 2s equals 836.50. And this is going to give us 4.50s equals 418.50. And you can go ahead and use your handy dandy magic math machine to get S is equal to 93. 93 salads sold that day. Alma bought a laptop computer at a store that gave a 20% discount off its original price. The total amount she paid to the cashier was P dollars, including an 8% sales tax on the discounted price. Which of the following represents the original price of the computer in terms of P? All right, so this one is a little tricky, I admit, but we got to understand um, discounts and sales tax, all those different things. All right, so we want to find out what was the cost. But let's start with what Alma paid. So the amount that she paid was equal to, now let's go on the inside. Um, there was an 80% discount off, um, a 20% discount off its original price, which means 80% of the original cost. All right. Now the total amount she paid was $3. So what she paid included an 8% sales tax on the discounted price. So that 8% sales tax, so this was... Um, the cost with the 20% discount, so the 80% of that, and now the 8% sales tax is 1.08 times that. Now, I've shown this in other videos where when we're talking about a sales tax, so if we have a cost, whatever the cost of the item, and the sales tax is the cost plus, and we'll just use the 8%, 0 0.8 times the cost, we can factor out the cost, and that gives us 1 plus 0 0.8 so 1.08 times C is the amount you pay with your sales tax. So that's where the 1.08 comes from. All right. Now, so what she paid, so what we're trying to do is isolate C in terms of P. Well, we're multiplying C times 0 0.8 and 1.08. So we need, just need to divide by that. So it's going to be P divided by 0 0.8 times 1.08. Voila, there we go. Let's make that look a little neater. Yeah. All right, reading tables. Dreams we call during one week. The data in the table above were produced by a sleep researcher studying the number of dreams people recall when asked to record their dreams for one week. Group X consisted of 100 people who observed early bedtimes and group Y consisted of 100 people who observed later bedtimes. If a person is chosen at random from those who recall at least one dream, what is the probability that the person belonged to group Y? So we're talking about probabilities. And when we're talking about probabilities, the denominator is going to be the group that we are choosing from. So it says the person is chosen at random from those who recall at least one dream. Well, those who recall at least one dream, all right, we have these 39 plus these 125. All right, so one to four plus five or more. So the people who recalled at least one dream was 164 is gonna be in our denominator. And now just doing that right there eliminates three of our answer choices. So that tells us that C is the correct answer. But continuing on, all right, so when we're talking about probability, and we're talking about the probability that the person belonged to group Y. So the, <clears throat> so the larger group we're choosing from is the 164, and then the group we're looking at, the probability, is going to be the group Y people, 11 plus 68, 79, and we've already established that C was the correct answer. 
The table above lists the annual budget in thousands of dollars for each of six different state programs in Kansas from 2007 to 2010. Which of the following best approximates the average rate of change in the annual budget for agriculture natural resources in Kansas from 2008 to 2010? All right, so the average rate of change is going to be the slope. What is the slope? All right, and we're talking about agriculture natural from 2008 to 2010. All right, so we want this slope here, and that is going to be, uh, can I fit this here, 488.106 minus 358.708. And that's from 2008 to 2010, so for two years. Now, let's look at something real quick right here. Uh, we could use our calculator, but I'm not going to. We can look at some estimations. 488 minus 358, that is about one, that's 130. And so we're talking about 130,000. 130,000 thousands is 130 million, because a million is 1,000 thousands. So 130 million, and then divide it by two. Now, which one of those is closest to 130 million divided by two for our rate, 65 million per year? And if you put the numbers in, yeah, you will get about the 65 million. But since we're talking about these large numbers, that's how we were able to estimate. Of the following, which program's ratio of its 2007 budget to its 2010 budget is closest to the Human Resources Program's ratio of its 2007 budget to its 2010 budget? All right, so we want to look at 2007 to 2010, and we're looking at human resources. So that's going to be, I'll just put it down here, 4051050 divided by 5921379. And that is approximately 0 0.68. I'll just write that right here, 0 0.68. So which one of these ratios is closest to 0 0.68? All right, no need to waste video time number crunching. I've gone, gone ahead and written the values there, and we see the one that is closest to 0 0.68 is education at 0 0.72. So the answer is B, education. Which of the following is an equation of a circle in the xy plane with center 0, 4 and a radius with endpoint 4 thirds and 5? Well, let's start off with um, the center. So since the center is 0, 4, that means in the equation it's going to be x squared plus, and then it's going to be, we change the sign. I think that's the easiest way to put it. Whatever the sign is in the coordinates, the sign is going to be opposite and the equation, so that's going to be y minus 4 squared. So that rules out b and d. And now to get the radius, or well, actually what we want is the radius squared. That is going to equal r squared. So the radius, we're going to look at our distance formula. So r squared is going to equal, and now we have x2 minus x1, so 4 thirds minus 0, so just 4 thirds squared, plus 5 minus 4, which is 1 squared, or 5 minus 4, which is 1, and then we want to square that. So that means r squared is going to equal 16 over 9 plus 1, getting a common denominator, that's 16 over 9 plus 9 divided by 9, which is equal to 25 ninths. So it's answer choice A. All right, H equals negative 4.9 t squared plus 25t. The equation above expresses the approximate height H in meters of a ball t seconds after it is launched vertically upward from the ground with an initial velocity of 25 meters per second. After approximately how many seconds will the ball hit the ground? So there's a lot packed in there. It says we got height, h, heights in meters, t is in seconds, tells us our initial velocity, and it tells us it's launched from the ground. And when will the ball hit the ground? 
So we got to understand that the ball hits the ground when h equals zero. So it starts off on the ground, and we want to know when it hits the ground. So that means we got negative 4.9 t squared plus 25t equals, when does that equal zero? Uh, we can factor out a t, so that's t negative 4.9t plus 25 equals zero. So those two factors, we already know t equals zero, h is zero, and then our other one is going to give us negative four, well I'm not going to say negative, because the negatives are going to divide themselves out. So 4.9t equals 25. 4.9 is very close to 5, and 25 divided by 5 is 5, so that's going to give us D, answer choice D, 5 seconds. Katerina is a botanist studying the production of pears by two types of pear trees. She noticed that type A trees produced 20% more pears than type B trees did. Based on Katerina's observation, if the type A trees produced 144 pears, how many pears did the type B trees produce? So it's saying type A produced 20% more. That means type A equals type B plus 20% more. So 1.2 times B. All right, so this was just like the tax problem um, we recently did. Um, we're saying A equals B plus 0.2 times B. All right, that means 144 equals B times 1.2. Now you can use your calculator here, but I'm going to tell you a little trick. All right, so notice that 1.2. One of the things I talk about is developing math eyes and looking at things mathematically. That 1.2 looks a lot like 12. 144 divided by 12 is 12. So since we're moving that decimal one place to the left, that means in our answer, that decimal moves one place to the right. Sounds more complicated to explain it than what it really is. So 144 divided by 12 is 12, so 144 divided by 1 1.2 is 120. A square field measures 10 meters by 10 meters. 10 students each mark off a randomly selected region of the field. Each region is a square and has side lengths of one meter and no two regions overlap. The students count the earthworms contained in the soil of a depth to a depth of five centimeters beneath the ground surface in each region. The results are shown in the table below. Which of the following is a reasonable approximation of the number of earthworms to a depth of five centimeters beneath the ground surface in the entire field? All right, seems like a lot to unpack there. Well, let's see, in our entire field, we've got 10 meters by 10 meters. And it is saying that it's broken into one meter by one meter sections. And they're measuring five centimeters deep, all right, in each one meter by one meter region. Now, based on the answer choices and the numbers there, we can go ahead and assume that each region, each one by one, is going to have 150 earthworms, all right. Now, there were 10 students in these. Um, that split up into these sections, meaning there were 10 of these one meter by one meter sections, all right? So if we say each section had 150 times 10 is 1,500. Well, that's just for the 10 students in those one meter by one meter sections. And now we've got to apply that to the entire field. So we have to multiply by another 10. So you're looking at 1,500 times 10, so 15,000. Answer choice C. All right, so we had a 10 by 10 meter field, so that's 100 meters. And each one, or 100 square meters, each one square meter region had 150, so then we just multiply that 150 by 100, 15,000. If the system of inequalities y greater than or equal to 2x plus 1 and y greater than 1 half x minus 1 is graphed in the xy plane above, which quadrant contains no solutions to the system? 
Right, so this one, we're going to have to graph this in, just estimate it. Y greater than or equal to 2x plus 1. So let's go ahead and put that in here. All right, and then Y greater than 1 half x minus 1. And that's going to be... And we know the solution is where these regions overlap. So they overlap. This isn't exactly drawn the way it should be, but they do overlap in quadrants 1, 2, and 3. There is no overlap in quadrant 4. All right, maybe that's a little better right there so that you can see that the solution is in 1, 2, and 3. Okay, let's go move on. For a polynomial P of X, the value of P3 is negative 2. Which of the following must be true about P of X? All right, let's look at our answer. X minus 5 is a factor of P of X. X minus 2 is a factor of P of X. X plus 2 is a factor of P of X. The remainder when P of X is divided by X minus 3 is negative 2. So what we've got here is our remainder theorem. All right, now if we're looking at um, the value of P of 3 is negative 2, so if we're looking for the value of P of 3, that means we're talking about the factor or the binomial x minus 3. And the remainder theorem tells us that if we want to evaluate a polynomial at some value c, then the value at that number is the remainder when we divide by the binomial created with that number. Clear as mud? All right, let me try to say that one more time. If we want to evaluate at P of 3, that means we're dividing the polynomial by X minus 3, okay? We take the same number, change the sign, create a binomial. And our remainder theorem tells us if we evaluate a polynomial at some certain value, the, the, the value of the polynomial at that number is the remainder when we divide the polynomial by that binomial. Okay, so it's answer choice D. Which of the following is an equivalent form of the equation of the graph shown in the xy plane above from which the coordinates of vertex A can be identified as constants in the equation? All right, let's look at a couple things here. Let's, first of all, since it's talking about the coordinates of vertex A, let's recognize that the vertex is at 1 and it looks to be about negative 16. All right, x plus 3, x minus 5, that is the factored form. We see that um, it crosses at negative 3 and positive 5, so the factors, we take those numbers, change the sign, create a binomial. So the factors, x plus 3, x minus 5, b is just nonsense for this. Uh, we've established that our vertex is at 1, negative 16, and so d is in vertex form. All right, I could have just started off with the fact that d is in vertex form but I wanted to show why we eliminate the other choices. So the answer, correct answer is D because that is in vertex form. And again, when we talk about the vertex, um, the X coordinate, we take this number here, change the sign. And for the Y coordinate, we keep that number and whatever sign is in front of it. And that brings us to the end of our multiple choice section. And on to our free response. Wyatt can husk at least 12 dozen ears of corn per hour and at most 18 dozen ears of corn per hour. Based on this information, what is a possible amount of time in hours that it would take Wyatt to husk 72 dozen ears of corn? All right, so we have Wyatt and he can do at least 12 dozen ears of corn per hour. So that is greater than or equal to 12 dozen per hour and at most 18 dozen ears of corn per hour so that is less than or equal to is at most greater than or equal to is at least and that is 18 dozen per hour what is a possible amount of time that it would take him to husk 72 dozen ears of corn well we need to figure out we have 72 dozen divided by 12 dozen per hour that equals six hours 
and 72 dozen divided by 18 dozen per hour that equals four hours so it is four less than or equal to W I guess it could have used T for time but anyway using W for Wyatt less than or equal to six all right so what is a possible amount of time you could say four we could say five we could say six because it's inclusive less than or equal to either one of those three numbers the posted weight limit for a covered wooden bridge in Pennsylvania is 6,000 pounds. A delivery truck that is carrying X identical boxes, each weighing 14 pounds, will pass over the bridge. If the combined weight of the empty delivery truck and its driver is 4,500 pounds, what is the maximum possible value for X that will keep the combined weight of the truck, driver, and boxes below the bridge's posted weight limit? So there's a lot of going on right here big word problem that we need to sift through all that wording uh, so what we're looking for is something to be less than 6,000 all right that is the problem we need to solve something is less than 6,000 what is less than 6,000 well we have the 4,500 pounds for the truck and driver plus all right we don't we need to know how many boxes can we carry so it's 14 pounds each times the number of boxes so we're looking for 14 X less than 1500 and that comes out to X less than 107.1 so the maximum possible value for X is 107 boxes identical boxes all right, another reading graphs. According to the line graph above, the number of portable media players sold in 2008 is what fraction of the number sold in 2011? Well, so let's look at 2008. So in 2008 is 100. And 2011 was 160. All right, so what is that fraction? This is just simplifying the fractions, all right? So let's go ahead and knock off those zeros at the end. So that's 10 divided by 16, which simplifies to 5 eighths, or 0 0.625. A local television station sells time slots for programs in 30-minute intervals. If the station operates 24 hours per day, every day of the week, what is the total number of 30-minute time slots the station can sell for Tuesday and Wednesday? All right, so Tuesday and Wednesday is two days. And let's, let's just set it up like this. Um, so we have Tuesday and Wednesday is two days times 24 hours per day. Put our units in here. Times... two slots s for slots per hour all right because s looks like a five is that better okay all right so this is uh just dimensional analysis uh, uh, just a regular thinking problem is what i call some of these all right so what we got so now we're looking for the number of time slots now the way we set this up our days are going to divide out our hours are going to divide out and we're going to be left with time slots so 2 times 24 times 2 is 96 96 30 minute time slots in two days